Hello, and welcome to our program, Quantum Poetics on Physics and Poetry, by Wake Forest University professor Amy Catanzano. I am Tanya Zanish Belcher, Director of Special Collections, and I would like to welcome you all. Thanks for joining us. Also, a special thank you to Barry Davis, IT specialist, for his technical assistance. This special program is sponsored by Special Collections and Archives in collaboration with ZSR Library Outreach and is part of the Dr. Samuel T. Gladding Writing Experience. The writing experience is named for Sam, who was a counseling professor and Wake Forest administrator, and his many contributions to publishing and support of students. Sam made a generous donation to Special Collections to support humanities programming, and we are glad to be able to honor his memory in this way. Some housekeeping items. Today's program will be coming to you via Zoom webinar and YouTube, and no, unfortunately, we will not be able to see each other. However, once Amy has finished her remarks, she will appear live and you will be able to submit your questions for her either in the YouTube Q&A box or the Zoom chat. Barry and I will be monitoring both. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the ZSR slash SCA YouTube channel shortly. And now about our speaker. Amy Catanzano, an associate professor of English and the poet in residence at Wake Forest University, will discuss her independent poetry projects as well as her collaborations with scientists that explore some of the most cutting edge physics and technologies of our time, such as high energy particle colliders, dark energy astrophysics, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence. The author of three books and a forthcoming book on poetry and physics with the University of Michigan Press, Professor Catanzano's honors include the Penn USA Literary Award in Poetry, the Noemi Press Book Award in Fiction, the Poets Out Loud Prize from Fordham University Press, and invited residencies at major scientific research centers such as CERN in Switzerland and the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics in New York. And now I will turn it over to Amy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tanya, for that introduction and the invitation to speak today. I'm gonna to be talking about my work as a poet who engages the field of physics in a practice I call quantum poetics. I'll be discussing my approach to poetry, my collaborations with physicists, and my forthcoming book from the University of Michigan Press titled The Imaginary Present, Essays in Quantum Poetics. Since this talk is open to the public, I'm gearing it to both specialists across literature and physics, as well as non-specialists and enthusiasts of these fields. One doesn't need to be a poet or scientist to get the sense that time is not what it appears to be. While some societies see time as linear with a past, present, and future, others see it as cyclical or abstract. We know that calendars, while useful in organizing time, are influenced by cultural ideas about nature. For example, a solar year in the Western Gregorian calendar is based on the number of revolutions that the Earth takes around the sun in a 12-month period. A lunisolar year in the Eastern Chinese calendar is based on astronomical observations of the sun's longitude and the moon's phases. Our experience of time is linked to memory and perception, shaped by our states of consciousness and psychological landscapes. Discussions of time and intersecting topics such as freedom and existence have featured prominently in philosophy and beyond. When we look at how the field of physics treats time, especially over the past hundred years, we see that scientists have made groundbreaking discoveries about the nature of time. Physics is the branch of the natural sciences that describes the structure of matter and how the fundamental parts of the universe interact. While physicists have provided insights that exceed our ordinary assumptions about time, so far these discoveries have yet to fully make their way into our everyday understanding. It turns out, for example, that time cannot be separated from space. At both the quantum world inside atoms of matter and the cosmological world of outer space, 
space-time operates in extraordinary ways that have profound implications on reality. As a poet who is always striving to maximize the artistry of my poetry, I began noticing how literary devices such as line breaks and rhythm uniquely navigate time and space. I started to see the page itself as a field of space-time, one that was interacting with poetic language. I was aware of how a poem's ideas, or what I think of as the mind of a poem, and how a poem's form, or what I think of as the body of a poem, can slow or quicken a reader's sense of time. Some poems even seem to suspend time. It was my curiosity about how artistic language works with time and space that led me to study physics in addition to literature, philosophy, creative writing. As my poetry practice developed, I began to see that the radical permissiveness of poetry gives it both power and intensity, since we use language to think and create. I also continued to prize innovation in poetry, since it was leading me to write and live life with greater depth. It was five years after graduate school at the Iowa Writers' Workshop while I was teaching literature and creative writing at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, that my study of physics was sparked by my curiosity about time. I read books on physics and learned how prevalent assumptions about time, space, and matter were transformed in relativity and quantum theory. I started to apply what I was learning in theoretical physics to my poetry and poetics, writing about poetic language in relation to scientific knowledge. I began focusing on quantum theory, which has a central role in physics, but is often viewed as counterintuitive by scientists and non-scientists alike. As a poet trained in unconventional thinking and alternative forms of perception, quantum theory felt highly intuitive to me, and so I began calling my practice quantum poetics. While I was hesitant to brand what I was doing with a single term, I found it useful in situating my ideas. Five years later, with access to university research funding and a new teaching position, I began going on site visits to scientific research, research centers, where I developed my knowledge of physics by talking with scientists and touring scientific experiments. And that teaching position is the position I have here at Wake Forest. I soon received invitations and funding from scientific research centers for longer visits and residencies. Now, in addition to my individual projects, I collaborate with scientists and give talks and poetry readings at scientific institutions. As my understanding of physics has evolved, so has my understanding of poetry. This knowledge led me to even richer experiences with both fields. It also gave me new questions about what is possible when these fields are explored together. Quantum poetics begins with the notion that ordinary conceptions of time must be revised in order to account for the discoveries that have been made by scientists about our universe. To achieve this goal, I treat the literary arts as a physics and physics as an art form. This approach departs from the usual placement of literature and the practice of literary art solely within linguistic, artistic, and cultural studies as well as the usual placement of physics solely within the natural sciences. In quantum poetics, I apply scientific knowledge to the study and practice of poetry while using poetry and poetic thinking to interpret this knowledge. After 20 years of studying physics as a poet, I now see the field of physics as a philosophical and cultural discourse that is subject to the artistic paradigms produced by its own scientific theories and experiments. I also see poetry outside of its common interpretations as strictly an expression of the sublime or a cultural and personal utility. Allied with the serious play and subversive thinking of the French symbolist writer Alfred Jarry and his pataphysics, quantum poetics offers what Jarry called imaginary solutions to our open questions about the universe. These solutions reject the intellectual vagueness and controlling dogma associated with religion and metaphysics and are instead sourced in the material innovations of poetic practice that join imaginative thinking with rationality. Quantum poetics proposes that quantum theory is encoded in and by artistic practice. 
It also works to expand what constitutes literary art and physics. The relationship of quantum phenomena to the study and practice of poetry that I discuss in my forthcoming book aims to challenge what literary art and physics can be, why they are valued, the forms they can take, and the context they can engage. Quantum poetics works to dissolve not only the boundaries between the literary and the scientific, but also the creative and the critical. The traditional split we often see between scholars and poets is not so unlike the split that occurred at the turn of the 20th century between theoretical physicists who use theories and physics for developing models of physical reality and experimental physicists who work with theories and physics to conduct experiments. Unlike poet critics who commonly write separate works of poetry and scholarship, I often combine a range of multimodal forms in a single project. My new book, for example, is structured by linked chapters that move between multiple genres and performance zones, including poetry, literary and scientific analysis, theory, lyric essay, memoir, and speculative nonfiction. Based on the idea that exploring discoveries in physics is necessary to treating language as a complex system within literature that aims to be innovative, quantum poetics is committed to what we might think of as the poetics of irreality, which quantum physics exposes. As mathematicians Xing Tang Yao and science writer Steve Natus say in their book, The Shape of Inner Space, String Theory and the Geometry of the Universe's Hidden Dimensions, in contemplating higher dimensional space, we must allow for movements in directions we can't readily imagine. We're not talking about heading somewhere between north and west, like northwest, or even north by northwest. We're talking about heading off the grid altogether, following arrows in a coordinate system that is yet to be drawn. Even though quantum poetics exists within a long tradition of writers responding to the science of their times, it departs from some of the conventions of this tradition by heading off the grid altogether in treating the ordinarily distinct fields of poetry and physics in union. While the term quantum poetics has been used by thinkers such as Daniel Albright to discuss modernist poetics and poets, Stephanie Strickland to discuss electronic poetry, and Gwyneth Lewis to discuss poetic form, what distinguishes my use of the phrase is the central role that quantum theory plays in my practice. Though the notion of the quantum is now common in literary fiction and across the arts, quantum poetics uniquely explores the laws and principles of quantum physics through poetry and poetry through those laws and principles. I'm especially excited by the cutting edge fields of quantum computing, high energy particle physics, and astrophysics, which rely on quantum theory in addition to other scientific models of physical reality. My interest in these areas of scientific research has brought me to the European Organization for Nuclear Research, known as CERN, in Switzerland, also the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in North Central Chile, the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics at Stony Brook University in New York, and elsewhere. At CERN, I'm working with a collaborator, the particle physicist James Beecham, to someday encode a poem that we are co-writing into a particle accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider, which searches for new forms of matter in a 17-mile tunnel underground by colliding subatomic particles at extremely high speeds. Once our particle poem is collided, we'll invite others to make additional poems from the data sets resulting from the collision. We've co-written a scientific paper outlining the technical specifications of the experiment, which we're in the process of submitting to journals. We're also writing a book, a user manual, for future generations to collide poems in more advanced colliders, including one that could potentially access the Planck scale, a term that refers to the limits of the known laws of physics. If physicists can find a way to access the Planck scale, all of their current questions about the known universe will be answered and new questions will arise. I first met James during my second visit to CERN in 2019 when I was there as a research artist funded by the Large Hadron Collider's ATLAS experiment and its U.S. outreach initiative, led then by particle physicist Mark C. Cruz. 
Mark, a professor of physics at Duke University, was part of the team that famously discovered the Higgs boson subatomic particle at CERN. That discovery led to the verification of the Higgs field, an invisible field that exists everywhere and with which all matter must interact in order to gain mass. This past summer, James and I continued our collaboration at CERN, where I was funded by Atlas again and sponsored this time by the, by the U.S. Department of Energy's Brookhaven National Laboratory. During that second visit to CERN when James and I met, I went underground to see the Large Hadron Collider. We took pressurized elevators to the Atlas and CMS detectors, where the particle collisions that seek out new forms of matter occur. Designed in layers of wheel-shaped metal overlaid with filigrees of braided tubes, the detectors looked like kaleidoscopic mosaics in motion, a complex interplay of the fluid and the fixed, the artificial and the organic. The center portal of the CMS detector was open due to work being done, and I was close enough to the collision chamber that I could see inside. My interest in science had taken me, a poet, directly to where the Higgs boson subatomic particle was discovered and where other new particles of matter could someday emerge. The next day, James brought me to see new upgrades being built for Atlas, upgrades called new small wheels, though they are massive. They looked like blue flowers woven with mint green veins under futuristic silver spokes. We spent hours in front of one flower talking about an idea I had when the Large Hadron Collider launched, an idea inspired by Christian Book's Xenotext experiment and Eduardo Katz's biopoetry that would someday encode a poem inside the protons of a collider. To my surprise, James said that the idea may be technically possible to enact. We immediately began brainstorming such an experiment. Under the spell of the blue flowers and through the fortuitous circumstance of shared vision, our idea grew, as poems do. Another collaboration of mine involves astrophysicist Satya Gancho Agancho, who I met at the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory when I was working with the Dark Energy Survey, an international collaboration of scientists exploring how dark energy is responsible for the expansion of the universe. Their research involves creating a high-resolution map of the universe through imaging with a special camera they built and mounted on a telescope. I participated in overnight observations of deep space with the astrophysicists, seeing billions of galaxies in the control room of the telescope as it imaged them. I wrote a book-length poem about dark energy, and Satya, who is not only an astrophysicist, but also a trained practitioner of a classical Indian dance known as Odessi, choreographed an original dance to my poem that we then performed together. We're now collaborating on another project, drawing from her work in a scientific collaboration known as DESI, the Dark Energy Spectrometer Instrument Survey. Our project involves making an experimental film that explores the poetics of her scientific experiment. My poetry will be the soundtrack, and her dance will comprise a portion of the visuals. We've worked in Tucson, Arizona, while she was on site at Kitt Peak National Laboratory, where Desi's work is being conducted. During an invited residency at the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics, I wrote an unusual poem titled World Lines, a quantum supercomputer poem, which is based on a theoretical model of a quantum computer. By talking with the theoretical physicist Giuseppe Musardo in an earlier visit to the Simon Center, I learned about topological quantum computing and spent the next six months studying it. A quantum computer computes information using quantum bits, known as qubits, instead of digital bits, making processing billions of times faster. My poem, World Lines, replaces the qubits in a theorized quantum computer with lines of poetry. Since the poem is built into the architectural form of a quantum computer that uses four qubits, each one made of two quasi-particles known as anions that crisscross over one another toward a computation, the poem takes on the properties of quantum mechanics. When two lines of my poem cross, they share a word where ordinarily a quantum knot would be produced in a topological quantum computer. The reader can read the poem in a linear way or choose a branch of poetry to follow when they get to a shared word. 
As a result, there are multiple poems within the poem existing in what's known as quantum superposition, where the quantum states of subatomic particles exist in all points in space and time at once until coming out of superposition into a defined state of existence. Quantum superposition is a key element of quantum theory and quantum computers. Whereas a digital bit can exist only as a one or a zero, a qubit can exist as a one, a zero, or any quantum superposition of one and zero. When I wrote the poem, I knew there were multiple poems inside of it, but I didn't know how to calculate how many. Michael Taylor, a computer scientist and climate researcher, knew how to make such a calculation. He built an artificial intelligence using a quantum script that he wrote to read my poem and express all possible versions of it. While the project is currently in progress, so far the AI has read over a thousand distinct poems inside my poem. Physics poetry collaborations like these ones help break down disciplinary silos that have existed for over a century, diversifying thinking and methodologies. Today's art science network abounds in arts installations, books and, antho and anthologies, magazines such as Scientific American, academic and literary journals, and elsewhere. Literary scholars have long addressed the art and science connection, sometimes through their teaching in addition to publications. For example, the scholar N. Catherine Hales, who theorizes the connections between works of fiction and science, has co-taught combined literature science classes at Duke with Mark Cruz. Academic organizations, such as the Society for Literature, Science, and the Arts, support connections between art and science. In collaboration with others, I've established a global collective, the Entanglements Network, comprised of poets, scholars, artists, and scientists who are also exploring the connections between poetry, science, and the arts. Poet Ed Roberson, an Entanglements co-founder, draws from his background in science alongside eco-poetics and African-American poetics. Ray Armentrout, a recipient of the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry and an Entanglements co-founder, has over 70 poems about physics. Entanglements co-founder and poet Will Alexander, as well as poets such as Maymay Bursenbrugge and former U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith, are among other poets today who centrally position scientific concepts in their poetry. Though it's not common, other poets besides me engage science by working in scientific laboratories. In their bio poetry, Christian Book and Eduardo Katz work with scientists to encode DNA proteins with language inside biological systems. The poet Adam Dickinson practices metabolic poetics to write poems about the pollutants he has in his own microbiome. The poet S.S. Prasad combines <clears throat> poetry with science and technology by integrating nanodimensions, dimensions beyond what can be seen with the naked eye, onto poetic text by using silicon microchips, which are usually used for computing. He was inspired by the scientist Gim Wei Ho. She works on silicon nanostructures through microscopic photos that she calls nanoflowers. Prasad wrote a computer code inside her microchips that replaces the numbers with words, creating poems that are byproducts of the chip design. Literary history is full of writers exploring science, including major figures such as Margaret Cavendish, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Edgar Allan Poe, T.S. Eliot, and A.R. Ammons. Similarly, scientists such as Ernst Haeckel engaged the visual arts by becoming, artist, by becoming an artist as he conducted experiments in biology, drawing what he saw. Today, the number of poets and writers who engage science and technology is growing, as is the number of scientists who are seriously pursuing connections between science and art. Some scientists are also accomplished poets and writers. For example, the astroparticle physicist Juan Jose Gomez Cadenas is a published novelist and poet who helped translate Ray Armentrout's poetry for a Spanish edition of one of her books. The ecologist and climate scientist Madur Anand is a published poet who uses her own scientific articles in her poems. She was one of 10 featured poets who I invited to a conference that I hosted at Wake Forest, Entanglements on the Intersections of Poetry, Science, and the Arts.
Despite the significant headway that is being made to explore the intersections of art and science, and less frequently, the intersections of poetry and physics, rarely does this interdisciplinary work capture the attention of the most resourced communities in science and literary culture. But the potential for this work to have larger impacts is strong. In quantum poetics, potentia itself is a central principle, though it's not limited to Aristotle's idea of potentia as change and process. Werner Heisenberg, co-founder of quantum theory, says that subatomic matter doesn't exist as defined matter within the real. Instead, he says, it exists only as potentia, as possibility within quantum superposition, where the matter inside of atoms is in all possible forms of space and time before coming into existence. Yet even form is not matter's essential nature, since nature itself, Heisenberg suggests, can only be defined by the questions we ask of it. Potency is another name that Aristotle gave potentia, and quantum poetics suggests that poetry as potentia may be the most potent question of all. Quantum poetics sees the written and spoken forms that poetry take as physical manifestations of possibility in potentia, the imagination made material. In this way, quantum poetics suggests that poetry acts upon nature as both a figurative and physical force, as both a symbolic and material push or pull on matter that changes matter's motion. Poetry moves us. When poetry acts upon nature as a force of physics, it is doing so, like all matter in the universe, partly as a quantum phenomenon. Poetry, due to its unique relationship to language and thinking, is especially poised to respond to a question that science on its own has been unable to answer. That question is, what does quantum physics mean? Quantum poetics takes this question on by harnessing the abilities of poetry as an artistic form of language to interpret and enact principles in theoretical physics. When we see science from a poet's perspective and poetry from a scientist's perspective, we can simultaneously think like poets and scientists at the same time, drawing from shared intelligence and imagination. In physics and poetry, time is not an arrow following a linear trajectory through a codified past, present, and future. In physics and poetry, time is space-time, combining the dimension of time with the three dimensions of space in the fourth dimension, and space-time warps the space-time in its vicinity, which in turn warps it. In his speculative essay, Combining Poetic and Scientific Thought, How to Construct a Time Machine, written in 1899, Alfred Jari proposes an imaginary present for which my forthcoming book is named. The imaginary present in Jari's essay is a second symmetrical present that happens alongside the real present at the center between a future and a past that is traveled by an explorer in a time machine. The explorer in Jari's time machine experiences two pasts, the real past and the imaginary present, which is the past created by the machine traveling from the future back to the present. As such, the explorer in the time machine experiences time as a curve, a prescient idea by Jari that the field of physics soon uncovers when physicists discover not only that space and time are one, but that space-time itself is curved. Jari's imaginary present, created by a time machine on its way back from the future to the real present, is an act of poesis, the ancient Greek word for making that led to the word poetry. By existing alongside the real present, the imaginary present subverts the assumed authority of the so-called real present with an alternative space-time made by technology, which is the time machine imagined in Jari's book, as well as the essay itself as a material form of imagination. The concept of duration, which we can see as the experience of time by the explorer in the essay, is a construct of memory at the continuous moment of its becoming in the imaginary present.
Since Jari's imaginary present is a phenomenon of a second past occurring at the endless moment of a novel now, it contains the future as it's being constructed, or as the poet Emily Dickinson said, forever is composed of nows. Jari's imaginary present is created by a technology using both scientific and poetic thinking. And like quantum poetics, it travels. Thank you. Okay, um, we've had our first uh, chat question or comment, and it is from Leanne Halberg, and she says, beautiful, thank you. Is your fascinating talk available in print? I need to think more about this. Uh, thank you, Leanne. Um, so it's not in print yet, um, this talk, but it is part of the introduction to my new book. Um, so I drew um, a majority of the talk from from the new book. So um, essentially, it's it's the introduction um, to the book, uh, trying to present some of the overall um, arguments that I'm making. And then the book um, proceeds as, you know, um, chapter by chapter is a, is a development of a lot of the ideas that I, um, that I spoke about in my talk. Um, Amy, while we're waiting for more questions, would you like to describe your World Lines project? Sure. Um, I began talking about it a little bit um, in the in the um, in the talk there, um, but yeah, I'm happy to discuss a little bit more about it. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, um, World Lines was um, built as a new kind of um, poetic form, um, so much like a sonnet um, or any other kind of poetic form. Um, the poem is uh, is based on a, an architecture, um, and in this case, the poem is based on the architecture of a of a topological quantum computer, a theorized version, uh, and um, a topological quantum computer computes by quantum knot. Um, these are uh, mathematical um, uh, devices that theoretical physicists build. Um, and uh, in a four qubit uh, quantum computer that's working with topology, um, each qubit, which, as I mentioned, can be um, a one, a zero, or any superposition of one or zero, um, each qubit has um, what are called two anions. And anions are the, these quasi particles that, um, that travel in a world line. Um, and that's actually the, the scientific name um, that has been given to the way that these anions travel um, toward um, another qubit um, that then produces a computation. So as I mentioned, I replace um, each world line or each anion um, with a line of poetry. And um, at the moment of intersection, they twist along a, a certain kind of path. And at each moment of intersection where a quantum knot would appear in a topological quantum computer, I, um, I have a shared word. Uh, and so what that did is the shared word, um, as I mentioned, creates um, this choice that the reader can make uh, to follow the world line in one direction or another direction. And if you read the poem just um, in a linear fashion, it's it's written in couplets. Um, it's written in four couplets, so it's an eight line poem, and that would be kind of the the um, the sort of Newtonian way of reading the poem um, using classical logic. But in the logic of quantum physics, um, and you read the poem using the quantum knot or the shared the, the shared word, um, you, all of these branch poems um, are possible but are not actualized until you actually until you read until you choose to read um, one branch or another. So uh, 
um, that, as I mentioned, created many different poems inside the poem. And I also said that, um, you know, I had no way of understanding how to calculate how many poems were were inside there. I thought <clears throat> at least a hundred, but I wasn't sure beyond that or even how to calculate it. Well, um, uh, Symmetry Magazine um, did a profile on me and of that project. Um, they are run by Stanford's um, um, laboratory in <clears throat> in particle physics and <clears throat> and also Fermi Lab publishes that magazine and they they did this profile on me and and that poem and. Um, I was contacted by a mathematician and computer scientist based in the UK, Michael Taylor, and he was fascinated by the poem, and we began talking, and um, he said that he had an idea, um, a way that we could potentially uh, discover how many poems are inside the poem. So he used um, the Python computer programming language, uh, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence technology to develop an algorithm and, and a quantum script um, that reads the originary poem, the, the poem, the Newtonian poem that's in couplets. Um, it, this script reads the, that poem um, to computationally express all possible versions. Um, so what he did is he parsed each sentence in the poem, identifying branch points um, words that are in common, so the the shared words or where the sites of the quantum knots would be, and then he trained a linguistic processor um, to choose world lines that are semantically logical to track how different topological paths um, move through a text map into different versions of the poem. And so I'm now using those variants as well as not all of them because there are many, but I'm using um, uh, there's sort of um, there are stages that the a that the AI program has read the poem in, and I'm using the first stage, which is um, twenty six, which is ninety six um, distinct versions, and uh, I'm using these variant poems um, as well as visual data from the computational process that created the variants for a book collection of computational poetry. So I'm going to present world lines um, in its originary form, um, and then I'm going to show it. Um, also, uh, like as as um, part of this topological quantum computing architecture, and then I'm going to present the 96 variants um, that the AI initially read. Although now there are at least over a thousand variants that have been discovered, and using those 96 variants, I'm going to perform or started to perform um, ex uh, literary experiments on the variants to kind of maximize. Um, so not through thinking about form at that point, but to maximize the content or the mind of, of each variant poem. Um, and uh, thinking about, you know, how, um, how each variant might both be speaking to or challenging the originary poem. The originary poem, the poem itself that I wrote is about, it is, is meta poetic. It's about itself um, as a topological quantum supercomputer poem. Um, so it's about how the mind um, uh, processes information like, um, like a quantum topological computer processes information in, in um, a creative and an active creative state. Um, that I call the imaginary present, um, that I also spoke about um, based off of Alfred Jarry's essay, um, How to Construct a Time Machine. Amy, uh, Amy. Yes, go we ahead. We've had a yes. number of questions come in. Okay, um, great. So first, Leanne's <laughs> going to want to know the publishing date of your book, but also I just want to read some comments from Leslie Grohlman. Brilliant okay. and inspiring. Thank you, Amy. Indy Bogue Hardigan, fantastic lecture. So exciting. Thank you so much. Judith Madeira, thanks, Amy. Great talk. And then a question from Linda Mao, in addition to Leanne's question about publications. Hi, uh, Professor Catanzano. Your work explores what's possible, which is captivating. In your study of quantum, quantum superposition, what were some challenges slash inspirations that led to your final construction of the poem? Okay, great. Um, so, t so thank you, Linda, and um, thank you again, Leanne. So, Leanne, um, <clears throat> the publication date uh, for the imaginary present is spring 2025. Um, so, I'm very, very excited about that. 
Um, and Linda, yeah, thank you so much for your question. Linda is um, one of my um, poetry students who's also a physics major. And um, she's been uh, um, thinking about going into the field of the philosophy of science. Um, and so um, she's just been a, it's been a real pleasure working with her. Um, so yeah, challenges um, related to working with the concept of superposition um, in world lines. Well, first of all, um, I think, I think uh, when I initially encountered the idea of quantum superposition, um, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, I was able, you know, it was, it, it, it seemed um, like an in intuitive leap to make creatively and um, logically based on poetic logic um, that, uh, and that at least in the, in the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory, um, particles, subatomic particles of matter, all subatomic particles of matter um, exist, um, you know, and maybe exist as a word that's stretching, but they, but, but they um, are in a state of superposition where um, they can be in any point in time or space um, at any moment of time and at any moment of space. And it's only until the wave function of the subatomic particle collapses that uh, they come out of superposition and into a defined state um, of what we call existence. And uh, so, um, you know, I immediately thought of Plato and, um, you know, platonic forms and, um, you know, just sort of thinking and also kind of like, you know, questioned the sort of ideological like nature of like everything existing in like this kind of everywhere and every when, um, you know, in a non-material way or um, maybe in a material way, but 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 in a way um, that I think um, physicists call it Hilbert space. It's it's you know so that it is a different type of um, you know it's 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 a it's a completely different domain, um, and <clears throat> uh, you know it it. This, I guess an initial challenge was um, was contending with some of the abstraction involved with the concept. Uh, and, you know, as a poet who is really um, like interested in the ways that abstraction can um, get us to, you know, think about um, language and matter and space and time in new in new ways. Um, I was friendly <laughs> to the idea. Um, and friendly to the notion of abstraction. So that helped um, overcome the challenge of imagining, um, and you do need your imagination, imagining, um, you know, uh, subatomic particles in a quantum superposition. Um, what's also interesting about superposition um, is that, uh, is that in superposition, um, the subatomic particles move um, outside of the law of deterministic causality, or what we ordinarily would call cause and effect. And this was something Albert Einstein had a really hard time accepting. Um, he was one of the major um, challengers to quantum theory, um, quantum physics. Um, but inside superposition, um, uh, the, quant the, the quantum states of these subatomic particles move by what's called quantum jump. And um, I talk, I have an, a, a chapter in my book about the quantum jump um, because I relate it to Lucretius's notion of Klinemann. Klinemann is this um, atomic swerve. Um, it was first introduced by Epicurus. And uh, it's it's um, it was sort of the, it was a theory that you know atoms an early theory of atomic matter that atoms fell down from the heavens and in a moment of spontaneous swerve um, they would normally fall in in lines and in a moment of spontaneous swerve they would touch um, each other to form matter. Well, artists um, and writers since then um, have used the concept of Klinemann or the atomic swerve as a as a way to explain creativity and imagination. That um, creativity and imagination um, rely on the swerve of of imagine uh, the swerve of insight, the swerve of um, of uh, of association, the swerve of improvisation. And um, so, uh, you know, this notion that quantum, that, that it, in quantum superposition, that subatomic particles are moving by quantum jump, um, you know, outside of cause and effect, 
to me, you know, that, that, that using the concept of, of Klinemann, um, the atomic swerve um, helped me negotiate that abstraction. Um, and so um, one of the chapters in my, um, in my book um, talks about uh how Alfred Jarry worked with the concept of Klinemann um, in uh, in um, his book Exploits and Opinions of Dr. Faustrol. He um, he he has um, the painter Henry Rousseau um, uh, encounter Klinemann, which is a beast and mechanical monster who wants to disrupt the authority and. Um, the sort of the sort of bourgeois authority of the museum and art making, and so this Klinemann monster um, essentially vomits uh, like new paintings on the wall, um, and these paintings are prose poems in Jari's book, uh, and so you know for for Jari um, who was a uh, um, you know, a nonconformist and um, somebody fiercely devoted to the notion of independent thinking and um, who challenged, you know, authority at all scales. He was really interested in the idea of Klinemann as a subversive force of the imagination. So that, so working with Klinemann helped me, helped me contend with um, the concept of superposition. Uh, and, um, and it seemed obvious when I wrote world lines, even though, even though in my studies of topological quantum computing, there was really no mention of quantum superposition, but because it was working with quantum, um, with principles in quantum theory, it seemed obvious that all of the potential poems in the poem <clears throat> were, you know, in a sense, existing in a kind of quantum superposition until their wave function collapses at the moment of the reading of the poem. Um, Amy, so, Amy. Yes, yes. We have mm -hmm. a large number of questions to get through. Okay, let's keep, <laughs> sure, of course. Please right. keep interrupting me because I'll just keep going. Um, so I'm going to combine the next two because they're very similar. Uh, first from Carolyn okay. Searcy. So amazing. So much of your work Aww. is scientifically, scientifically complex and mind-bending. Do you ever get overwhelmed by its enormity? And then from Danielle Ferrara, you're such a badass, Amy. I have so many questions. I would love to hear more about how all of this has moved you. Do you feel closer to reality or further away from it, more a real? Oh, such good questions. Um, okay, so for the first questions, uh, yes, I, I'm constantly overwhelmed by the complexity of bringing these two fields together, but I enjoy it. I like the intensity of it. And I like the challenge of it. Um, you know, the hardest part is balancing, um, you know, my curiosity and interest in this kind of work and my practice with going on site visits and working with physicists and reading um, with, you know, the rest of my life. <laughs> so that's, that is the challenge. But I think that's a challenge that any artist faces or anybody who's, you know, highly dedicated and invested and um, driven by like what they're, what they're curious about and what they're working on. Um, so you just manage it, you know, and um, so I do get overwhelmed by, by it, but uh, you know, in a sense um, it keeps my life, my mind lively and uh, you know, it, it, it is a kind of welcome overwhelm. Um, I also take breaks from it when I need to and um, that can help, uh, you know, help see, help me see things um, from new perspectives. Um, so th yeah, thank you so much for that question. And then um, Dan and Danny's question, um, Danny is a student, uh, a former student uh, who has a new book coming out. Um, Danny, Danielle Ferrara, she um, was at Naropa University at Boulder, Colorado and um, worked a lot with um, quantum poetics. I taught a class on quantum poetics there and we connected. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's a great question. How does it move me? Um, well, you know, in a very real way, when I said at the end of my talk that, um, quantum poetics travels, um, you know, like, like the explorer in Jari's time machine, you know, I meant that both figuratively and symbolically. So I think, um, one way that this work moves me is, um, first of all, it, you know, physically, I'm, 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 you know, I'm moving in a lot of different directions, um, traveling to work um, with, with 
different people or going to conferences or, or talking about these ideas. Um, and that is combined with, I guess, um, sort of the pleasures of the way that the mind um, is in constant motion or moving. Um, uh, when, you know, when I'm in, when I'm investigating um, these ideas, or when I'm writing poems, um, I don't just write poems about physics. Um, I'm always, in, you know, I'm always kind of, um, you know, I, I, you know, quantum theory is, is um, always there when I'm writing, but I'm not always writing about it. Um, and in fact, that's something I, I strive not to do because I think um, World Lines is a good example of this where it's not just a, it's not a poem about a topological quantum computer. It's a poem, you know, that is, that is um, interacting um, with topological quantum computing and expressing um, uh, ideas in quantum physics. Um, so uh, I'm really interested in that, that threshold um, between like the about and the actuality or the doing. Um, and so, uh, so e even in poems, when I'm just writing other kinds of poems that um, have nothing to do, that are not about, or even actively engaging um, in, in, you know, a concept or a theory or an experiment related to quantum physics, um, or other types of physics, um, even when I'm writing those kinds of poems, um, all of that, you know, uh, everything I, everything I, um, you know, think about, about this intersection between poetry and science is always there and I can draw on it. Um, and that has helped me, you know, um, uh, also see form itself in new ways. Um, I've been rhyming a lot more in my poems lately, um, you know, uh, thinking, uh, and they've become a little bit more formalized. Um, and, you know, that's something I've been thinking about is almost like a kind of mathematical, like a somewhat of a mathematical structure that I've been giving my poems, or at least a kind of, um, you know, give, put, bringing in more patterns um, in order, and then, you know, strategically breaking the pattern at times um, for effect. Um, so, yeah, so um, uh, as far as the other part of your question about uh, reality, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, and I think that instead of maybe um, situating my response as being either closer, more like closer or further away from reality, um, the work that I'm doing um, questions the authority of the so-called real and um, both, you know, from um, a scientific standpoint, um, from a philosophical standpoint and artistic standpoint. So um, I wouldn't say that I'm either, I wouldn't say I'm closer to it. I would say, um, or, or further away, I would say that, that um, this work has me thinking um, a lot about the nature of reality and questioning our axioms and assumptions that um, go into our belief systems about, about, um, about consensus reality and about um, the inheritances of those belief systems on our writing, on our art practices, on our thinking. Um, you know, so uh, one of the things I really love about physics and quantum physics in particular is that um, it's it itself, you know, I think represents a, 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 a paradigm shift when um, science um, became not became more than science. Um, it, it really does constitute a kind of wholly new philosophical system that has not really been properly attended to. Um, and so, uh, you know, that system, um, yeah, is something that I'm trying to work through using the lens of quantum poetics, which depends on poetic logic and poetic practice. Amy, we need to go on to the next question. And Danny, if we have time, I'll come back to your second question. This is from Melina Treforis, and she says, this was so interesting. Do you think this type of work opens the possibility for courses co-taught by professors in different departments like creative writing and physics? Yes, um, Melina's in my um, in one of my um, poetry classes right now. Great question, Melina. Um, 
So, yes, I do. And actually, um, two semesters ago, I taught a course, um, a special topics course in creative writing called Space, Time, Light. And it was a course where we looked at literary and scientific treatments of those phenomena um, and then did writing exercises and produced, um, you know, poems, essays, uh, um, stories that were interacting with those phenomena through these two vantage points. And in that course, um, I had three physicists from our physics department um, come and give presentations. Uh, um, Paul Anderson and Danny, um, Kim Shapiro and Eric Carlson um, came and gave amazing presentations on quantum mechanics. And um, Dr. Kim Shapiro actually um, brought in um, the equipment to perform the double slit experiment in class, which um, demonstrates um, something called wave particle duality. Um, this is when uh, light can be either, um, you know, either a wave or a particle, depending on how it's observed. And it gets to a, a primary principle. It discuss it. It reveals the primary principle in quantum theory that has to do with um, that the observer of a measurement um, always affects that which is being observed. Um, so uh, uh, um, Heis actually Werner Heisenberg, the, the co-founder of quantum theory says, um, you know, what we observe is not nature in itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. And I think that um, I've also written in, in, in the book, I have a, a a chapter on the idea of the reader, of a reader of a poem or a viewer of an artwork as a kind of quantum observer who changes um, the interpretation, ch changes the, the artwork itself through the act of um, measurement. Uh, so um, uh, probably more to say about that, but maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm going to jump ahead um, real quick to Raymond Brock. A uh, very interesting talk. Thanks. I'm a particle physicist at Michigan State and work with the Duke group, Duke group on Atlas at CERN. Is your paper with James available on the physics archive? Ah, great. Hey, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, we are, um, so right now we're submitting, the paper's complete. We um, finished it at CERN this summer and we are now submitting it to journals. Um, and so we're in the process of doing that, like right now, um, we're submitting the paper to journals. And actually one of our questions to the journals um, that we've been contacting is, can we, um, can we, uh, um, Published paper on a on a preprint server, um, and so we're waiting to hear back if that's if that's okay, um, because um, some of the journals that we're working with are journals that are primarily arts and humanities based journals, but that it but that work with science, um, and uh, but we also are considering all kinds of journals, including scientific journals. So um, so right now it's not on the it's not on the preprint server, um, but uh, also just want to say I'm just you know incredibly grateful to Atlas for the opportunities that they've given me to be at CERN and work with James um, and to and to Mark Cruz at Duke. And um, yeah, you're everybody I've met there has been so wonderful, so welcoming. And um, you know, I'm especially thankful to James um, for uh, for, um, you know, for, for, um, yeah, for this really exciting collaboration. Um, here's a question from Mark negative land. As you write poems, do you see slash create your work as needing these understandings you go into here to be able to get it, or it can exist independently, but these insights act as a deeper way into the work? Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, that's a great question. I would say the latter. Um, I don't think, I think that um, I always strive for each poem to be able to exist kind of on its own terms um, without this specialized knowledge. And, uh, and that's because, um, um, you know, the audience for this kind of, for, for this work is not only specialists, but people who love poetry um, and or people who write poetry and may not know much about science. So, um, so definitely, <clears throat> definitely, um, I, I want the poems, you know, each project that I work on to be able to have like, a, a, to be able to have, um, you know, um, artistic weight, it kind of, um, uh, at first glance without having the specialized knowledge. However, um, you know, like a lot of things that, that inspire us, if you feel inspired by a poem, you tend to, you know, or artwork, you tend to want to 
look more in, you want to look into it more. And, um, so, um, you know, I, I hope that, um, for those who are curious or interested, um, they, that they, you know, um, look further and, um, and that will help them, um, see different dimensions of the poem and different ways that I'm, um, working with physics in the poem, um, uh, or, um, or ideas in physics, um, that may not be readily accessible or even, yeah, readily, um, understandable upon a first reading. Um, here's a question from Mary Summers. A highly creative approach to exposing the creativity required of science and exposing the disciplined or formed thought that is required of poetry slash the arts. I wonder if you have or will offer a webinar conversation with, say, a physicist that explores the concrete benefits of this approach to science and poetry, STEAM versus STEM. I love that question. Yes, um, absolutely. I'd be I'd be thrilled um, to offer something like that. And in fact, you know, um, for example, James and I, we've been collaborating since 2019. And um, due to the pandemic, a lot of it was over, you know, during those years, it was it was over um, Zoom. And uh, I always, you know, we had we would have the most amazing conversations. Um, because, you know, we're, you know, not only talking about our project, we're talking about all the ideas about it. And as we were developing it, you know, we just had the most incredible conversations. And you know, there was always this thing where we were like, we should, you know, kind of be recording this. These conversations are so kind of interesting in and of themselves. You know, um, like I talk with my students about poesis, um, <clears throat> you know, it's the path toward the poem, right? And so in order to um, write vibrant po poetry, you know, you, there needs to be a path toward it. And, and the more vibrant that path is, the more vibrant the outcome is, the poem itself. And um, so in my mind, the path toward the poem, all of this work that I'm doing, you know, to get to the poems, um, these site visits, that's all part of like the poetics of each of my poems. Um, so, and so, uh, yeah, um, I would love to do a webinar with a physicist um, and talk more, um, to be more in conversation, um, like a direct conversation between um, between a poet and a physicist. I think it's a great idea. And um, yeah, uh, it's um, also thinking about ways maybe to do more documentation of um, poesis, of my own poesis, like going like this path toward the poem and and finding, you know, um, yeah, uh, finding ways to bring some of that, <clears throat> some of the, these interactions that I'm having, bringing them out in a more kind of formal setting. Thank you. We're going to go back to Danny's second question. How do you envision the transformation from the imaginary to the material? Is that a question of the imaginary present as well? And would you say that's part of your poetic experiment? Yes. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, it is a big part of my poetic experiment um, it, uh, because I'm interested um, in the material as a as a um, as an ex as a physical expression of um, of the imagination. So I tend to think of the imagination as a kind of sense, like it's not really just this like abstract. Um, I think of it like as an actual sense perception, a sense that we have that is often not acknowledged. Um, and uh, so, yes, I see, um, you know, I, I think I, I think of the imagination as um, as both like a vehicle toward um, toward the material. Um, but it also has, you know, it also kind of exists in its own, in its, in its own dimension to use that word figuratively and not, and not, um, not literally necessarily, but I, I think, um, you know, it, I think any art artist, um, you know, working with, um, working with poetic logic, um, whether that's in a poem or some other art form, uh, you know, it depends on, it, it, it you know, it depends on where you want to end up. Um, you know, if you're interested in making art or poetry that's based on consensus reality, um, or that's, um, uh, you know, um, thinking about, um, sort of thinking about, uh, um, 
poetry as a, or, or, or art as, um, as I think I mentioned in my talk, as, as, as purely a, a cultural or personal utility. Um, and, you know, then if that's your, if that's where you want to end up, or those are like, maybe you're not even making a decision to end up there that you just think that, you know, that's where you should end up, or that's, it's the only place to end up, then the imagination, right, it travels in a, in a, in a certain kind of way to get there. But I think, I think um, sort of where I want to end up <laughs> is um, in, in this material context is, is a kind of everywhere and everyone, like the qu quantum superposition. I'm like trying to find like a way back <laughs> in a certain sense to, to superposition um, where anything, un, uh, you know, where anything can happen at any time in any moment. So there's like the, per there's a, you know, in my poetic imagination, there's a lot of permissiveness in that, in that, um, in the idea that um, that the imagination can travel to a space that has no border. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share a question with Indy uh, from Indy. There is so much to dream of with here. I love the statement about the poetic page being a field of space time and the potential in that. Numerous collaborations you mentioned bring poetry off the page as well as other into other kinds of manifestations. Interested in your thoughts on working on the print page versus other kinds of presentations? Oh, great question, Andy. Um, yeah. Um, so I think, I think, um, you know, this. So when I think about, so when I initially started working only on the, you know, I was only working in the environment or the setting or the ecology of the page, um, and I talked about, you know, in the talk about seeing how space time was um, a sort of field. Of its own um, or a dimension of its own on the page that was interacting uniquely with poetic language, um, that that definitely it that concept of the idea of of space time, space time and how poetic language works with space and time it changes depending on the medium. So um, I was invited um, after my first visit to CERN. Um, there were there were some poets and artists who were also computer software um, programmers. Um, based in the Netherlands, and they invited me to be part of, to contribute a poem in a new type of software program called 3D Poetry Editor. And um, this software program does very, very interesting things with space and time. So they invited like a representative from several countries um, um, throughout the world to submit to, to use this new software program that they developed and then to write a poem. And then it was, um, was exhibited at the Rotterdam International Poetry Festival. So I, um, you know, first learned the program. I was, um, you know, it was, it was working with, yeah, it was a completely different kind of, it was a di different kind of setting entirely and space and time were sort of working uniquely with it. So um, if I remember correctly, I guess it was a few years <laughs> Four years ago, five years ago, there were um, there are certain certain like if you write a lot, if you have two words near each other, they create a node, they connect. Um, but there's a center of gravity that actually like at the same time pushes um, pushes the words apart. So there's all this like very, so the poems are like film, like moving films, they move. And um, so I had to, um, so I, I wrote about, I wrote a poem working generally with the idea of wave particle duality um, because I thought it spoke to this setting um, and to sort of the unique way that space and time was operating with gravity. Um, in my book, I talk a lot about gravity um, uh, you know, um, sort of, you know, um, theoretical physicists, um, some of them, you know, um, talk about high gravity universes and low gravity universes, you know, our, our universe is thought to be a low gravity universe. And so I talk a lot about um, actually Gertrude Stein's writing as a kind of um, high gravity universe, because of the density um, of her work, um, you know, gravity brings matter together. Um, but I've also since then studied um, dark energy, which is, um, which is uh, a phenomena that um, pushes matter apart beyond um, the scale of galaxies. 
And um, so I, it would be actually really interesting to go back to 3D Poetry Editor and write a poem about dark energy um, because of the way it works, um, because it's, it's kind of a repulsive gravity. It moves matter apart. And that's what um, is responsible for the evolution of the universe um, or um, the expansion of the universe, um, according to, um, uh, to astrophysicists. Thanks, Amy. And then you have one last question from Elizabeth. So cool. Could you read one of your poems? Um, okay. and, or you may want to let her know where she can find it. Find your poems. Okay, sure. Well, um, I have some writing up at um, on my website, um, amycatanzano.com. So there's a number of um, like uh, you know, um, poems that are on the web. I, uh, um, let's see, I don't have any, I don't actually see if I can find one. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just grab one of my books. Okay. This is maybe an older poem. But this was, I'll, I'll read the poem where I first used the word quantum. How about that? It's kind of apropos. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a poem um, <clears throat> where I first used the word quantum. This is an old poem. Um, and I started working on quantum poetics. I think I had by the time I wrote this poem. You know, actually, maybe not. I don't know if I'd quite started yet, but I, I was, um, no, I had, I had started. Um, okay. This is called notes on the enclosure of cores. And there are <clears throat> like 12 poems with a similar title notes on the enclosure of waves. And I was working with, um, Deleuze and Guattari's idea of enclosure. Um, so that's a whole other thing, but I won't go into it, but I'll read this poem. The ice sheet records its own history, drilling right into the dome peak. Its continuum veil we trace ourselves, making underwater points of entry as something like pearl drops from the edge, where I am always gathering a present terrain from a hinge inside the shore. As I'm thinking about placement, how there is something to learn even from an empty map of the known universe, which reveals the nova woolen in bloom, rejecting its point of origin in favor of something else, a quantum arrowhead, invisible, loosening the lithosphere from my eyes. Thank you so much, Amy. I think that's all of our, you've answered every question. Uh, thank you so much for an excellent presentation and for such won wonderful answers to all the questions. And thanks for everyone for attending. We really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Tanya. And thanks to all of you for attending. I really appreciate it too. Thanks.